Right, um, I've got two Pats with me today. I've got Pat McGart, as usual, and I've got Pat Coyle, an old friend from the BBC a long time ago, uh, who is now living in Dublin, uh, and who no doubt will be able to give us a few um, different points of view. Uh, one of the things that we were talking, uh, Pat, Pat, that's Pat in Dublin, I call you, Pat, was that uh, this notion of religion as a result of the lockdown, having made some kind of a comeback to getting these emails from people. What, what, what's your own thinking in that fact uh, in Dublin? Well, I think a number of things. I, I do think obviously this happens that in a time of crisis are ultimate realities. And this is ultimate. I mean, people at the bottom line are afraid of death. I mean, mm. that's the bottom line of it for everybody because even though it may take older people and may take 80% recover. The truth is that it's a higher mortality rate and it can hit a newborn baby and a 103 year old can walk out of, can recover in Italy. So people don't know. So there's the uncertainty and there is the fear of dying. And in situations like that, you do start to ask ultimate questions and ultimate questions involve um, God, whatever you conceive that God to be. I, I, there is a part of me there is, that is very uneasy about some of the stuff that has been coming out from both from a lot of angles. Um, in the right wing, the the extremely the conservative, the neocons in the states, and that they're coming out with their "this is a punishment from God," you know, on this awful society yeah. that listen, yeah. blood, they're using it. Boy, are they giving it welly, and it is awful to read and if that's their god they are welcome to that god and i want them. <laughs> um on the other side you know you have this sort of the this um very um sort of spiritual i don't want to say new age in a disparaging way because i think there's a lot of really good stuff in what was called new age but this whole spiritual movement where they're talking about you know being grateful for this and grateful for them i'll never be grateful for a virus that kills one human being and do, it's a it's an amazing virus and I look at it in awe and think, my God, the way it works and it goes into the immune system, it disguises itself. They look like your own cells that are protecting mm -hmm. you. I mean, you can't but look and read about it and think it's amazing, but I'm not grateful for it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that it's that holding that line, I think, where for me and my own faith, like I really felt myself pushed back to asking this question as I was going through Lent and as I was reading about God is in everything and God is in all of creation and the beauty of creation and the wonder of creation. And then I'm thinking, did you create the coronavirus then? Are you in the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. And so, like, your, I found that I was left with a really more, more ultimate questions of, you know, Shakespeare's nature, red, tooth and claw. Like the way the whole of the ecosystem is structured, it's not great. Like that, you know, we tear one another apart if you're a polar bear. Like I can cope mm. with human evil where we have a choice. Mm. But when a polar bear has to survive by tearing apart another animal, or when the wildebeest goes across Africa, falls down with a round, uh, roundworm in its uh. ear, and find itself being torn alive by hyenas, like there's something wrong with the structure. But that's that's Pat, 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 that's that's the way it was long before the coronavirus ever showed. Pat, Pat, Pat Begart, what what are you what are you going to say about it? Pat. Oh, I, I, what Pat was saying. I, Wait, I, Pat, I Pat, Pat could you adjust your could you adjust your phone? We're just getting the top half of your head. Ah, oh, yeah, sorry, my apologies. Well, that's much better. That's much better. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think? No. You know, I think that last week, Jude, we were talking about the fact that is, uh, I, I brought it down to one very simple thing that was purely anecdotal. A fella, and I mentioned this, I think I've mentioned it twice now, a fella I know who's a total atheist actually sent me a prayer. And I thought to myself, if this guy is sending me a prayer, something's happening that I can't explain. And what Pat was saying is, you know, it's a, you know, it is a very cruel world. You always have to ask yourself the one question, if God exists, how did they allow so many people to die in the concentration camps and six million Jews disappear from the face of the earth? And you go all, but maybe there's not an explanation that we can come up with. But there is a, um, you know, as Pat was saying there about, you know, the polar bear that survives by tearing something else to bits and all mm -hmm. the rest. R right now, 
I do think we were on the wrong path. You know, this, I, and I am not, you know, one of these Bible thumpers or anything like that. But when I looked at the election of Trump in America, Boris Johnson in London, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and I keep forgetting the name of the guy in Hungary and all the rest of it, right wing, thugs, populists, and all the rest of it. And you sort of say, I said, are, are we going down a road where a complete clown who's a total narcissist, uh, egotist, possibly uh, some sort of predator of some kind. And the ev evangelicals think this guy is a role model. Yeah. You know, this is insane. Are you, you thinking know, that... Are, are you the, 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 white, the white Americans think Donald Trump is the answer. But the, uh, I'm going to finish this point, Jude. How, how did he convince people in Rust Bucket states, a billionaire, selfish guy who's never been known to do a decent thing in his life for anybody, convinced them, this billionaire was uh, guys who wear shirts like I'm wearing today, that he was their savior. And you're going, what chicanery is this that he can get to political power? And yeah. I'd say the billionaires, the millionaires are the morons that are voting for him. And you're going, this world is insane. Uh, I think that th I, I tend to agree with you largely there, Pat. Um, I mean, uh, I think people turn to a strong man or a strong woman in times of uh, poverty and crisis in their lives. I don't mean the coronavirus. I mean just sheer poverty and dead end and rust bucket states and all the rest of it. Uh, so I think that's quite easily explainable. I don't see any link between um, Trump, uh, Boris Johnson and the coronavirus other than the fact that both of them are making a mess of trying to deal with it. I don't see it as, as uh, you know, part of God saying to us, you know, that we're going on the wrong path or that somehow or another the appearance of these two guys is linked to uh, a punishing God. I, I don't see that at all. The, the, last th the thing I would say about it is this. Of course, it's a, a very deadly thing. Of course, it kills people. But all sorts of things kill people. And all of us are going to be killed, if you want to put it that way, eventually. So if you can accept the fact that there is such a thing as death, I don't think we should get too disturbed about the fact that there is a death comes for some people through coronavirus. Uh, I remember the woman, the woman who published my um, last book, um, um, Mercy Air Press. She's a woman, I would say she's in her early 80s. And the first time I met her with another woman, uh, she was um, she came out of the hotel where we were talking, and she lit up a fag. And I said, uh, "Oh God, you know you you never grow good and strong and big uh, if you smoke cigarettes." And the woman, the other woman, said, "She, you're going to die of something, aren't you? You have to die of something." And that's in a sense the, the line that I take with coronavirus. Not that I wish it, but you have to die of something. And this is just one more thing that people die of. It doesn't affect my faith in God or anything else like that any more than I suppose, I suppose there is the problem of evil and there is the problem of suffering, but it's just another part of it. Nothing extraordinary or unique about it. Yeah, but I think, Jude, we put a huge amount of effort as a, in, certainly in Western society, into denying death as a reality. And I think it's a human experience. See, what I'm really talking about is that I think the coronavirus has left me with the experience of what Keats called negative capability, where you have to hold contradictory things in tension. Yeah. And we do that all the time. We don't always think about it, whereas now these are ultimates that we have to think about. So I will hold intention. I mean, I'm still a believer, and I will hold intention the fact that I cannot reconcile, as Pat was saying, the concentration camps, the, the evil that there is with an ultimately um, utterly good God in whom we believe there is no evil whatsoever and who mm -hmm. does not will ever suffering or mm -hmm. evil. Mm -hmm. I'll hold those together, but you're holding them. But I do believe that uh, me personally and as a society and as a world, we put an awful lot of effort into denying we're going to die. Because it's all yeah. nicely talked about in the abstract, good, uh, but uh, you're not in your deathbed yet. That's right. And that's you're right. not usually, and I have, you know, faced death a couple of times in the North in the Troubles, not least Bloody Sunday. I went through Kubler-Ross's five stages of dying in 30 seconds in Rossville Street in Derry. Um, in five seconds, I didn't realize it. I was 14, I was fast forward down to Dublin, I'm 25, I'm lecturing in UCD 
on Kubler Ross to a night class and we're working through the stages of the dying and I suddenly get a flashback and I am literally looking at this big group that I'm lecturing to and thinking I'm on Roswell Street and I'm going through those five stages. So when when you're really faced with death, it's it's I find it a scary, no matter how much I believe in what's on the other side. I don't know. I don't know for sure. And I'd love to know for sure. Mm. And number two, I don't want to leave the people I love. I yeah. love being alive. I love this life. And I don't want to leave it. Uh, uh, what do you think, Pat? Pat and Dave? Julia, um, oh, it's, back, it's back to this whole one again. Uh, the, the famous one about there's there are no atheists in the trenches. Pat Coyle is 100% right as far as I'm concerned. Basically, Jude, when I start thinking about death, if I ever want to frighten myself, you know, uh, what do you call it, start thinking about death, and then I run away from it like you would, you know, um, uh, you see in Bolt couldn't run faster than I can when I start, you know. You know so the, the whole thing, I think that, why, what we're, why I think we're talking about this, I think the whole thing about uh, coronavirus has brought it home, uh, and I'm getting back to Pat again, a three-year-old child, or it was a three-month-old child, died somewhere in London from it, and a 103-year-old man, I think it was in Italy, recovered from it. It's so random. It's so scary. Uh, you know, there's no such thing, you know, as... Uh, by and large, we like to think we can control our destiny, you know, other than life and death, I know, at the start and at the finish, but in between, we are in control. With this virus, it's unseen, and it's all the, re all the rest. And, Jude, I think you're missing the point to a certain degree. This is not about rational thinking. This whole thing is about, this is brought home to a whole lot of people. You know, by and large, we get up in the morning, go to work, come home in the evening, at the weekend, we uh, maybe go to the pub and cut the grass or whatever. Coronavirus, dude, I went out yesterday for a walk, and uh, it's about a mile from here, and I came back up, and I think I was telling you this, came up the top of the road, it's, it's the main road between Litter Kenny and Derry. Usually on a weekday, it's pretty busy, but on a Sunday, with half of Derry going out somewhere to Donegal, he could hardly get onto the main road. Yesterday, talk about Erie. It was like a lunar landscape, not a single vehicle on it. That's what's changed, and it's brought home to people. All the normalities, or whatever the word is, or the realities of our daily life have been put, totally changed, and it's brought home to people. How much are we in control? And is there another factor at play here? Hey, it's got nothing to do with rationality, Jude, nothing whatsoever. It's uh, this whole thing of fear of, hey, here is something we can't control. And that's where God comes into it, and that's where religion comes into it. Well, uh, yeah, well, I, I can understand the whole thing about being afraid uh, of the coronavirus getting you or somebody you love. And yeah. I also can understand the, the fact that people would be afraid of death in any form. Uh, I mean, I, I would be much I'd be the, at the head of the queue in terms of paradise. But on yeah. the other hand, you know, and I think we should move on from this. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's no point in there's no point in being at a party and consulting your watch the whole time. There really isn't. Yeah, fair no, point. I'm not doing that. I'm having a good time. Yes, you are. I can <laughs> see you. You've got your. Watch. No, like, I, I don't know which <laughs> is going to turn up on any particular morning when I wake up here. Like that's what I mean. You're still yourself, and you're having a bit of crack, and you're cooking, and you're doing all those things. But it's all changed as well. And, you know, I think it would be a lie to say that, that you see, for me, it, do, it makes me think about other things as well. Yeah. And, um, and that's okay, you know. And I, I love being with my two adult children who are here. And I think I never would have had this time. They'll be heading off and getting married. And isn't it great? They're in the house with me. And I, even if we have killings some of the times, <laughs> we learn to get over it and yeah. move on. Uh, but, but it's a changed landscape too. Okay, Pat said one of the things Pat had up for Pat uh, Pat Bagart had up for discussion was this thing about freedom of movement. Um, you were saying Pat Pat Bagart, you were saying that uh, you find it very uh, sort of difficult to be confined the way you are. Yeah, Judge, uh, I am retired now and I, and I had a certain amount of freedom. You know, see today Easter Monday. What me and my dear wife would normally do is right Easter Monday, just get in a car. And we used to go on a magical mystery tour. We could go north, we could go south, we could go east, we could go west. And by the way, it was totally random. We might end up in West Donegal, or we could up in Port Clannon or somewhere. It got, you know, just random. And we'd stop off maybe for a cup of coffee or so on. Uh, the last day, we went up to Letter Kenny, which is literally 10, 15 minutes up the road. Uh, we were going up to one of the supermarkets to do the sort of the shopping. Stop by the Gardaí, buy a queue of cars, 
left again on the way back, stopped by the Gardaí, two cars and all the rest. And the other day at the border, now I wasn't there personally, but a friend of mine told me the Gardaí were stopping people and turning people back and all the rest. Now, the whole idea came into my head, Jesus, this is what an open air prison is like and all the rest. No, we had taken for granted if I wanted to go somewhere, or my Rosie wanted to go somewhere, we would just hop in and we would go. No, the whole concept of that, I had taken that so much for granted. I also, I sort of feel like now, or understand how, you know, they said a modern day prison is a, a soft option compared to the old days. Yeah. But see the, the psychological thing, when it, I presume when the, the, that cell door slams behind you, you might have your TV, you might have a, but you know if you're getting a 20-year jail sentence, you're going to spend the rest of your days uh, with somebody else telling you what to do. The whole idea of you know that freedom of doing things. Remember the old, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the guys in, in America, I can't even remember, the, the mountain men. They went further and further and further from the sort of the convergence or whatever the word is you want to use of society. They went up uh, the sides of mountains and hunting them. I can understand why they, they did that. It was this whole idea of, of freedom. And fr see, when somebody prescribes your freedom, it's a very strange thing. And I, I wasn't really aware of it until uh, this whole thing. Now, I have not seen my kids or my grandkids. In fact, there has been no one on our street for about, what, six, eight weeks? Uh -huh. Okay, Pat, Pat, Pat Coyle, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a really yeah, listen, good... Listen, jump in, incidentally. Don't be waiting for me to tell yeah, you. No, well, I, it's just you don't want to speak over because you'll knock them. Yeah. Off, but I, uh, before just before um, this all started, I was in Berlin with my two grown up kids, and we went to a Schassenhausen, which is a it was a prison concentration camp outside Berlin, and um, it was pretty harrowing. I was spent the whole day there, but when you know you saw the conditions that people were kept in, what it was like, and I have been thinking like the that constriction of freedom that Pat mentioned there. You know, at least I have my house and I have my doors and I can go over to the park. We're within two kilometers or so, kilometers, so we're near a beach, we're near a park. We have to keep social distancing. But what keeps coming back to me is what it must have been like for those people to have their freedom taken from the Anne Frank up in an attic, never knowing when it was going to end. Like at least we're thinking, well, if we get a few months out of this and maybe even a year at the most, if we have the vaccine, they're bound to have a vaccine. Um, that it, just that constriction and the way Pat said that there now really made me think oh, imagine that must be what it is like to be in a prison that you know they close the door your, your freedom is taken from you and I I find that hard I definitely do um, but I can't stop thinking about how people survived and didn't know when there was going to be an uh, end in uh, sight uh, uh, you know I, I at times yeah, that, that, that really must be hard where you don't know in terms of prison sentence, like people being yeah. interned and that kind of thing. But uh, I'll tell you, I, I begin to wonder if I'm normal at all. I don't you're mind. Not, I really well, you're don't not mind. good. <laughs> not just, but that, I knew you were going to say that. I was leaving myself open there. I, I knew um, you just cross them over, Jude. I'll head them on. Go ahead. <laughs> I repeat, I don't find it a problem. Um, I, I mean, I'm somebody that came through uh, six years in St. Columns as a boarder, and I know what you're talking about when you talk about that sense that you can't get out. Uh, and so it was a, that was a part of it, that confined base, never getting out of town. It was awful. I hated it. But maybe that was because I was young, and maybe it's because you, most of you people are younger than me. I really don't mind. Where do I want to go to? The only thing I miss is being able to go for a, long, a longish walk or a jog, which is something I did practically every day, and I always felt better after it. But I, if I haven't got it for a couple of weeks, it's, it's not a big deal. Yeah, but you're probably an introvert too. Like, I think this is the one time that that Myers-Briggs thing, you know, the extrovert and the introvert, the introverts energize from within, whereas extroverts draw their energy from being out and mixing with others. And I think this must be an ideal time for introverts as well, um, Jude. So instead of being mad at you're 100% right. My wife is a much more extrovert person than I am. She loves going out. She goes to the cinema. She meets her friends and all the rest of it. I can sit here quite content. In fact, if you get me a good book, and on an occasion a nice glass of wine, like I am a hermit. I, I can sit here for hours and end, you know, uh, but my wife, she's fighting this, uh, I think, much tougher than I am. Mm, mm. Uh, are you, are you, 
how are you spending the time? Because I, I was thinking about this, and it's really a matter of uh, are you using uh, are finding new ways to kill the time, or are you actually using the time to have new reflection? We were always being told, you know, that in the hurly burly of modern day life, the frenzy of activity, we hadn't time to stop. We weren't thinking it was mindless pursuit of you know material goods, etc. No. Here we all are. We've all got lots of time in which to think. So are we thinking? Are we really? Well, I think, I, I suspect that Pat Coyle has been thinking uh, more deeply than I have anyway, that's for sure. But yeah, I think she has time. too, because she's come up with better answers than I have anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, the I last <laughs> the, the <laughs> truth is, Jude and Pat, I am here and I am working from home, as are my two kids. So I actually am busier than ever. So I, I don't, even though I am thinking, I find myself really busy because I'm in the communications business. I'm recording people. I'm putting it up online. I'm doing all the things that I um, would have done in my office. I have transported my laptop. And I did this before it started because I knew this was going to happen. So I can do everything from home that I could have done in my office. And it is incredibly busy and I'm wrecked when I go to bed at night. And I envy all these people that are saying they're doing all the DIY things and all this stuff <laughs> because I, I have no time. There's tiles falling off my bathroom and I keep saying, I must get them done. And I genuinely don't. But, I'd, but it still doesn't mean I don't have time to think because I'm always pondering my brain, as my granny used to say, um, about the things. But I, I find that stressful enough now. I'm finding the workload and then cooking and then, you know, knackered at the end of the night. I find that a bit stressful, I'm going to be honest and say. Jude, what are you doing with yourself? I'm just doing the things I normally do. Um, I go out to the garden and do a wee bit of gardening. I uh, watch TV in the evening. I watch Netflix. Uh, I'll do a bit of reading and I'll try to hammer out a few uh, blogs and a bit of other writing as well. And that's the size of it. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, I've become very friendly with du Dulux. It's a paint. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my wife says, you know, uh, we've been married more than 40 years. And she says, this is the first time I've ever concentrated on a house. Now, the choice is either, <laughs> you know, uh, you come in our door now, and if you turn right, it's like a new palace because every room has been painted. Now, I'm not saying it's painted like in a, anywhere approaching a professional standard. But, uh, uh, you know, it is looking like a new house. But if this lasts another month, um, she'll, be look, she'll be so pleased. <laughs> Do you know why? I wonder uh, what you think, Pat Coyle. I, uh, I, I, in ways I find when you do, I find myself connecting with people that I otherwise wouldn't have done. You know, I wouldn't be uh, each week meeting with Pat McHart or uh, meeting with you as well mm -hmm. now, Pat Coyle. Uh, and I find that, that when you do that, you sort of concentrate harder on getting what you have to say said and listening to what the other person has to say. Whereas if you were meeting them in a more face-to-face -face situation, it would probably be much more casual or uh, more lo extended longer. So I kind of appreciate the intensity, as it were, of meeting with people like uh, we're meeting now. And also I find it's useful to be able to uh, email to people and talk to them. You know, I'm getting a lot more online correspondence or communication than I was before. Do you not find that? Yeah, but you used the word there again, intensity. And I think that's true. And it's funny, there are people that have come into my mind that I haven't been in touch with over a longer period. And I think I must give them a shout to see how they are. But again, Jude, the thing about that is there is an intensity in the communication, which is also tiring as well. You know, I think everything is quite intense at at the moment and that would be one of the things that is both good and is both tiring as well. What about you Pat? Yeah and funny thing to uh, I have in recent times strange thing I've actually got people uh, there's one guy a friend from way back hadn't heard from him in years and suddenly he's been in touch and, and a couple other people so there's just um, this thing has brought back people into my life that I hadn't really been talking to them. And as well as that, you know that you tend to take your family like and your brothers and sisters for granted. But I've been talking to them more than I have been this last week. You know, you're all very close when you're growing up, but then life gets in the way. I think it was John Lennon said that. And you you know, you go your way in there. Now, um, I've been talking to some of them and we've been, you know, and all that. So I need to try and make a more of an effort to contact people. But the odd thing is, 
people have, uh, as Pat says, there, people have come back into my life. You know that I hadn't. There's one guy uh, there, I hadn't heard from him in about five, six years, and he sent me an email the other day. Oh, you know, to say basically, Pat, I hope your everything's okay and stay safe. Well, and it was lovely to hear from him. Mm, yeah, yeah. So there are there are upsides to the thing. I think um, the question mm -hmm. you raised the last day, uh, Pat McCard, uh was would would this change or how would the things be changed when and if we get rid of this damn virus or at least corral it? Um, I, 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 I can never go back to that one, but here I'm cutting across you, sorry, Jude, but here's the problem about that. I don't know how things are going to change, but can we, uh, the, here's Pat uh, Coyle seems pretty good in the old philosophy there, but can we go back to where we were before, or will things go back to where they were before? I have, don't have the brain power to figure out where this is all going to land eventually, but something tells me we cannot go back to the old status quo. That's as far as I can put it. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Pat Coyle? Well, yeah, two things exactly. I think there has to be some kind of change. Um, I, I, and I hope we can hold on to some of the very positive things that we've been talking about, like the fish in Venice on the canals. The, I mean, one of the things that I heard was that in China, less people actually died overall during the cri the COVID crisis yep. because yep. the pollution was so bad that people who were dying of respiratory illnesses, when that pollution stopped because all the factories shut down, it was less than the number that died with the COVID virus. Now, then I'm thinking, oh, that's great. What a great thing. And then next thing is I'm reading, China's starting to be up and moving again and the factories are pumping and they're making more and more stuff to send to us. Um, so... I, I still think Pat's right. I think there will be changes because that whole movement of looking after the environment and the ecology, I think we've had to look at this and see that we can't go on treating the world the way we're treating it. So I would hope that. I would hope Boris Johnson will treat the NHS with more respect and will do a U-turn on the awful, how many years of absolutely destroying that system that has mm. saved his life by his own words. Mm. Um, I think in Ireland, overnight, we abolished the two-tier health system. Will we go back to that? Can we? And I'm really excited about that. And then on the other hand, I think human nature is human nature. And also, I am, you talk, Pat, about Trump, Johnson, the populist movements, like the, the new capitalism is aggressive, global powerful mm. and it is going to take some forces to stand up against it it really is and i really suffer from the depression again that pat mentioned regarding trump that that it's not i'm watching the west wing every night if anybody is it's on sky and i re-recorded i watched it before i'm watching it again i watch it through the eyes of donald trump being the pre president now and the concerns that they had about the media and what would the media say? This isn't the West Wing. Oh, if we say this and if we don't say that, Donald Trump has put a horse and cart and more through all that because he has a Republican Party that is not prepared to call him on anything. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about an amoral, neoliberal capitalism that is rampant. And I don't know what it's going to take mm -hmm. to unhinge that. Right. I would love that this crisis will do it. I'm not right. so sure. I think I, th I would almost totally agree with you, Pat. Incidentally, we're about to run out. I'm getting a signal here that we're going to run out of time with uh, using of Zoom. But uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think people, uh, it's like uh, Jerry Fitt once said he was a 35,000 feet Catholic. You know, you're very involved with God whenever you're suffering danger, the kind of thing we were talking about earlier. Uh, but uh, I think Boris Johnson, likewise, will be awfully grateful. But he'll confine his, his uh, gratitude to what I think is the biggest con trick I've ever heard, standing, getting people to stand out on their doorstep and clap. So we'll not give you a raise, we'll not fund the NHS, but we'll, by God, we'll really, we'll probably give you a medal for the really good work that you did. I hope that's not too cynical. I think it's small ways, I think things change all the time. I think we'll see the, all the possibilities that uh, communicating over the internet uh, brings, both in personal terms, and even more important, perhaps, in terms of work. Because so much time and so much pollution occurs in terms of people getting into the car and driving a couple of miles every day, sometimes go traveling for hours to get to the work yeah. and back again. So that could be, those could be big changes. 
Last word there. We'll start with Patrick. Well, I, I do just go to Leonard Kenny. Uh, it's the nearest town to me. And I, on a normal, uh, take away the coronavirus, I would love to know how ma many uh, hours each person loses per week stuck in traffic there. I would love to know how much pollution goes under the air by ca uh, cars sitting idling, waiting to go five yards forward, five yards forward. Five. How much time people lose out of their lives uh, sitting in traffic jams that could be used with their families and all the rest of it. So, and that's a wee small town, rural backwater Donegal. What's it like in New York, Chicago, London, uh, Sydney? You take it. Somebody, some person with the, uh, you know, who looks at culture, must have a look and says, is this the best way to live? Mm -hmm. well, it's certainly give it a matter for pause. Uh, final thought, Pat, Pat, Pat Coyne? Yeah, uh, my thought is like we, if we fail again, it will be a failure of imagination because I think there is so much that we could do and learn from this to really transform the world into a place where you know we do look after the weakest, where the 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 people who are poor, the people who are the most vulnerable, that we realise that they're in that position usually because of our affluence. And I would love to think that we could really imagine new ways of creating a better global society since we have been so globalized, even in the creation of a cure for the coronavirus, like all the people coming together, including China. Mm -hmm. like, if we learn from that, and I would love to think it would be, I think it would be a great, great lesson. And it would be a, a tribute to all those who have died and lost their lives. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, needlessly, really. Absolutely. Uh, I think they always say that the only real teacher is experience. There's no point in talking about stuff in a way, except you go through it yourself. And we've gone through something different here for sure. So you'd like to think it'd carry over. Listen, guys, thank you very much. I'm, I really oh. enjoyed it. And if I wasn't getting signals here telling me to shut up, uh, <laughs> to tell you to shut up, I would uh, continue for the next hour or so. Um, We'll talk again. I'm going to stop the recording now.